All right. Welcome back, everybody. Rich Brubaker from Collective Responsibility, and this is Ask the Collective, Episode 5. Uh, it is really a fantastic spring day this afternoon. Blue skies. Thank you, Lee Kuchang, for bringing that to us over the weekend. Um, we're going to be focused on a single question this time because we got a really good question. It's something that I can spend hours teaching on, but I'm going to try and condense that down to you into about five or eight minutes because it underpins a number of the issues, the challenges, and then the development of solutions that we're really facing. And so I wanted to spend a little bit more time addressing that versus maybe going through two to three, four questions this time. And I hope that you enjoy that we're just doing it this once, and then I hope to have your feedback either in directly to me or in the comments below. So with that, we're gonna just get started and we're gonna jump right into the first question. Ding Ye asks, as China's growing middle class rises in affluence, so did their expectations, and fewer individuals are willing to tolerate pollution. It seems like there's a rise in not-in-my-backyard attitudes in China, but how could we turn that into environmental and sustainability awareness? You know, this is a really great question because if you use the word sustainability, sustainability already is its own big term, and the reality is, as we talked about in previous, like, you have to be able to find a way to bring that topic down to something that can be focused on. Because the reality is, with, whether it be air pollution or food safety or you know, labor, whatever it may be, there's very quick fixes that can be made. And we've seen these in Beijing with APEC blue or you know, just like a week of blue after a really bad week of black, horrible smog. And that's because the government on a very limited capacity can just shut off the factories, shut off the construction sites, take all the buses, chain, you know, take cars off the road very quick wins that can clear the air. But the reality is to maintain that takes a whole level of commitment that clearly has been difficult to maintain. And so when we talk about real change, we talk about systemic changes that are long-term in nature. We kind of boil these down to three questions that need to be answered and then each question has its own constraints. So the first question is what you've just asked. When will things change? And the reality is that whether it be air pollution, gun control, populism and jobs, whatever it may be, when things really change, it's when the problems become too big to ignore. So for decades in China, and particularly say since from 2000 to maybe 2010 in China, air pollution was unknown. I mean, you couldn't walk outside, you couldn't look out a window without knowing that smog was a problem. You couldn't be a medical professional in a hospital without knowing smog is a problem. But having limited agreements on this and then knowing or then accepting that to act on this problem, you're going to then maybe reduce GDP, reduce income potential, reduce something, you have to take from somewhere else. You know, you're only gonna do that when the problem becomes way too big to ignore and the problem is personal, which is the second constraint. It needs to be personal. And we've seen this kind of globally on social issues that we agree are a challenge, but don't directly you know, affect my life or my child's life or my network of people who are inside my, my nuclear network. You know, if it doesn't affect someone I know or myself, I'm not gonna change it. I'm certainly not gonna say at that point that the problems become too big to ignore. A third thing that needs to happen is really the stakeholder interests need to align. In air pollution in China, you know, environmentalists were off on their own. Government was kind of, you know, focused on GDP. And depending upon the city itself, the, the, the residents may or may not be in alignment. So in Shanghai, where expectations are rising with the acquisition of wealth, that may not map directly to a third or fourth tier city. Someone who hasn't made it into the city, or even someone who has been in the city but hasn't necessarily had the time to accumulate wealth or to stabilize their own financial conditions. And so stakeholder interests are really difficult to align. But what we've seen in the last few years is that's moving very quickly into complete alignment where the government, Li Keqiang making an announcement, backed up by the media, backed up by environmentalists, backed up by residents, backed up by industry. The interests are aligning. Now, that doesn't mean that change happens because when they come in alignment, they have to act together. And for that to happen, you need an effective catalyst, which is really our second question is, what, do, what is an effective catalyst? And for us, there's kind of five constraints or five things that when we see it, we go, that's an effective catalyst. The first one is immediacy. You know, in Shanghai in particular, Beijing as well, 
the immediate looking out the window and either not being able to see out see out the window or just recognizing how bad it is when you're looking at your app, 280, 400, crazy bad AQI numbers. That provides a level of immediacy. That immediacy translates into tangibility at a much higher level. So it's the shock and awe of the event or of the situation or of the condition that you're looking at that's just, you know, I can't accept this anymore. It's personal for me. We have to act. And that part leads into the third one, which it has to be actionable. You have to, as an individual, feel that you can do something. You know, this is the problem with sustainability is the polar bears are too big. Solar panels aren't something that I necessarily bring to the market or are a solution for me as the individual level. But turning off my lights is. Saying that I won't buy petrol from this gas station is. Saying I won't buy the stock of this coal company is. It's actionable. There's something I can do. At the same time, it's engaging, which is number four. And take the ALS uh, ice bucket challenge as an example. That moved so fast because it was engaging. You would nominate three of your friends, and those friends would be like, I'm going to do it too, and I'm going to nominate three. It, it, so it kind of grew from there. Engaging could be mothers protecting their children and talking at school, working with the school administration to make sure that our kids don't go outside in the smog. And then the last one is speed of action. And I really go back down to a lot of you know, political tension. It could be, you know, in the States, it could be gun control. It could be something else where you know there's a problem. It's tangible. You know that you can act on it. It's engaging, but it takes too long to get there before the catalyst can come together. Like, it's not, you know, the, the, you can all act together at the same time. You're kind of all waiting for something to happen. You're all waiting for the catalyst. And in that time, the fire kind of burns out. When we look at, you know, kind of summing that up, when we look at effective catalysts, again, we, we talk about immediacy, tangibility, actionable, engaging, and speed of action. And that's why, at, at least at this time, if you talk about air pollution, some of the other challenges that China's facing, the government can lead because the speed of action is there for them more than anyone else. Even if they may have historically said, we can pass that on to another group, we can try and work with industry, we can hold off you know, citizen concerns or citizen demands as it, as it may be based on the city. Now they're able to actually, because there's, ver there's clarity for them, they know exactly where to go, be it you know, cars, be it industry, be it energy, um, looking at different things within the economy to adjust. They also understand that they can drive um, engagement and they can drive um, different stakeholders coming together. And that's important. And at the end of the day, they have the speed of action because they know that if they're not seen as acting fast enough or acting in tune with the rising expectations, that they're going to have their own challenges, their own problems. They may have protests against a certain factory. They may have other concerns that they have to worry about. And so they, more than anyone else, when they feel speed of action and they can act, you can see real movement quite fast. And that's, that's a great thing. We need to see more of that. Now, the third question is, you know, you have the basic buying that things should change. Everyone agrees that it's tangible. You have an effective catalyst and everything lines up, like people are out on the streets or people you know, or government officials are going to visit factories or whatever it may be. The, the, the catalyst itself is happening, but then what? And the what is just as equally important as everything else. Now, we put these into two categories of push and pull. And push is when the government leads. So, it's government regulation, it's taxes, but in China, it's also the incentivizing and disincentivizing different industries to come into or leave a certain city, a certain region, or even the country itself. And we're seeing that in high intensity, uh, high resource intensity industries, highly emitting industries, or industries just, that just add low value, you know, be it textiles or be it small electronics, where the country wants to be seen as an innovator. The country wants to be cleaner. The country wants to be more efficient. The country wants to bring you know, a better quality of GDP. So the government pushes those that are in the way out of the way. Now this takes a long time, and I think that anyone who's been in China as long as, you know, certainly as long as I have, but even on a shorter time frame, they will note that you know, in the first tier cities, the conditions are different than the second, third, and fourth tiers. And so literally, it starts in the tier ones and it will move its way out, assuming that the mayors or the district mayors feel comfortable in doing so without risk to GDP, without upsetting the balance um, that they have locally. 
Externally, if you're talking about firms who are publicly listed, you know, this is where investor demands are becoming really interesting, where the divest coal movement has been very effective, I would say, in the West. It's not something that's happening here, but it's definitely something that's pushing people into a new model. Now, the pull side, this for me is the most interesting, and I think for sustainability as a whole, I wish that we would move more towards this, move away from just pushing compliance and really finding ways to harness increased consumer and citizen expectations and actions and really inspiring industry, inspiring brands, inspiring governments to realize that the future needs to be different and that they need to be taking steps to one, understanding that those expectations are rising, what they look like, and then also working with them to map to that, to map their actions towards it. Right now, like sustainability and air and anything else, it's always kind of beating people over the head. But it doesn't need to be that. You can inspire or help people aspire to something better. And that's where we see a lot more of our brands, a lot more of our conversations going forward. Because they're really looking for a way to continue engaging. And if you want to continue engagement over the long term, you can't do it with a stick. You need carrots. And you need those carrots to be healthy, organic, orange carrots that everyone go, I want, to, I want to participate in this activity. I want to work with you to help innovate. I want to cross borders. I want to work within my industry with competitors. Um, and then the last one, and probably the most difficult one that kind of maps back to investor demands changing, would be leader brand and legacy. This is something that on the pull side we see more and more of, but it's still very limited by the industry itself. And these could be the Paul Pullmans, Yvonne Chouinard, but in China, Jack Ma. Um, in, in Hong Kong, it's Esquel. These are firms led by individuals who have a different vision of themselves because at the personal level, they see that things need to change. They've been catalyzed, and now they believe it's kind of their legacy to lead that change within their own company, within their industry, or within their region. And so for me, I think, if there's anything I can take that I'd like for you to take away from this is that it's a process and for real change to happen, real systemic change to happen, real negative externalities to be removed from the economy while the positive externalities remain, it's going to be a process. It's going to be one that's long term where the challenges need to be agreed upon, where engagement needs to happen, and where through cooperation, through collaboration, through inspiration, solutions are brought into the market. It's not going to be a single government mandate and a single leader saying we need to turn off the lights, take off cars, and move away from construction. Because the reality is, for the next 35 years, 40 years, we're going to be building a lot of cities. We're going to be bringing a lot of energy on board. We're going to be bringing a lot more food on board. The challenges are going to persist. The question is, do we just try and create a bare minimum through compliance or to try and create a whole new way through inspiration and a sense of aspiration? So thank you very much for your question. I really hope it answered it. And for the rest of you who are watching this, I hope that this gives you some greater context in how we approach things, but also how we feel that it should be just generally applied to. We look forward to your questions. We hope that you'll ask more questions because we have a, we're gonna be doing this every week. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe, please ask questions, please like, please share. Thank you very much and have a great week.